Uh, my name is Paul Reed. I'm the general manager of the Association of Independent Festivals, a trade association for independent festivals in the UK. Uh, thank you to the British Council for the invitation here, and I mean, I'm blown away to be honest with, with the attendance. Um, to see how many people are here on, on a Friday evening as well is, is very impressive. So thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, it's great to be here in your country. It's rather cold, but I've been in St. Petersburg for a couple of days, so I'm, I'm kind of used to that by now. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a brief introduction to the Association of Independent Festivals. We were formed in 2008 uh, to unite and empower independent festivals in the UK. It started with a small group of 12 promoters uh, sitting around a table talking about shared issues around crime and security and other things. Uh, it's grown to a network of 65 uh, festival promoters. And um, I'll come on to some examples. Uh, you know, we have some very large festivals like Boomtown Fair, which is uh, 60,000 people, 60,000 capacity, uh, right down to a lot of smaller events that are 5,000 capacity and under. Um, so that gives you an idea. Um, the primary purpose of AIF was to create a national network of leading independent festival promoters. They meet several times a year and work through issues facing the industry, uh, taking the temperature, networking, connecting festival promoters to each other. So it still serves that purpose. We also offer business support um, and development services, so things like legal helplines, financial health checks as well, uh, mentoring schemes within the membership. We do a lot of campaigning and lobbying on behalf of the sector. Um, so we create a, a collective voice for the festival industry to government and to other parties. We run public facing campaigns. Um, for example, last year we did a, a large campaign around creating safer spaces at festivals. Um, and we also run our own uh, training events as well. Uh, we have the Festival Congress in the UK each year just on 450 delegates, a two-day conference and evening celebration, and last year several festival promoters from Russia attended. So this visit um, with, with me and Rebecca is a, is a bit of a follow-up to that. Um, so it just gives you a, 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 bit of, um, a bit of an idea. I mean, in the wider sense, festivals are such an intrinsic part of UK culture now. Um, and obviously there's the economic impact as well. So UK Music's Wish You Were Here study in 2017 revealed that 3.9 million people attended a festival in the UK and that live music fans generated 4 billion in pounds for the economy um, in that same year. So for AIF, our collective, the collective audience of our festival is over 600,000 of all of our members and that generates over 200 million a year for the UK economy. So it just gives you some idea about what the organisation does. Okay, I just wanted to talk about a couple of trends in the, the UK market that we're seeing emerging, and I'm sure there will be some you know, common issues as well with, with Russia. Um, so we're seeing a lot of market consolidation and saturation uh, from major companies in the UK at the moment. So last year we did uh, some research, we looked at every festival over 5,000 capacity in the UK and we found that one single transnational company called Live Nation owns almost 25% of them um, and that's only going to intensify. Of course, the other way of looking at it is that almost 75% of them are independent. So I guess that's, that's the way that you can flip that around. Um, that does have a knock-on effect, those ownership issues, uh, to independent festivals in terms of access to talent, and booking, and exclusivity deals. It does have that kind of domino effect. Um, I'll come on to some examples, but 
uh, there are more experience based events in the UK now. So we do a lot of research around why audiences buy tickets. And in our most recent survey, 54% of those asked, when buying a ticket for a festival, what is the single most important factor? We replied that it was the general atmosphere and overall vibe and quality of the event. Um, and only 7.7 .7 replied headline acts, 26% replied the music generally. And that was over 4,000 respondents. So that gives you a bit of a sense of an idea. Um, there's a picture of Secret Garden Party there that was quite pioneering in that sense. Um, in terms of being a, a multi-arts festival that wasn't just about the musical lineup, although that still is, you know, integral to a lot of festivals. Um, so festivals, there's a lot of immersion, interaction, creative production, and that's kind of where the, the new frontier of, of festivals is at the moment in the UK. In addition to that, and I'm aware in Russia that most of the festivals are city-based, um, so they're either multi-venue or they're based in sort of urban locations in, in parks and things. We're seeing more and more of those in the UK as well, and I think it's a very attractive format because you can you can market it as a festival. You can pack a load of talent into it. Um, you can cater to an audience that might not want to camp, um, and you can take over a city or town. Um, with using traditional venues and non-traditional venues and obviously you don't have the extremely high infrastructure cost of building a town or city in a field although as Becky will come on to city based festivals do uh, carry their own, their own challenges and it doesn't mean it's more straightforward just because it's a city based event um, but yeah we're seeing more and more of those across the UK so I just wanted to give five uh, quick examples of festivals that I think give good insight into the UK. No doubt you've heard of this one, <laughs> that's the really, you might have heard of this one. Um, so obviously it's the largest Greenfield festival in the world, 177,000 people, uh, it was founded in 1970, um, and it's, you know, Customary still the ultimate kind of multi-art extravaganza, um, you know, from headliners on its iconic pyramid stage to all sorts of weird and wonderful things happening across the site in the various areas they have. So in that respect, it's, it's a constant source of inspiration and it's the festival that a lot of other festivals aspire to be. It's started a lot of trends in the UK. This is Boomtown Fair near Winchester, um, 60,000 capacity, and they have, as you can tell from the image there, they have incredible creative production. Um, they have several themed towns around the, around the festival site. Um, they have 110 micro venues and things that you can discover, and there's an overarching narrative to each event, so each event is a chapter in a story. Um, it's a very sort of hedonistic and inclusive and truly kind of otherworldly event. It's very impressive. This one's Blue Dot. Uh, it's a relatively new festival, just going into its third year. Um, it's got an emphasis on science and education and technology alongside music. Um, and it's 5,000 capacity, but it's staged at Jodrell Bank Observatory in the northwest of England, uh, which is the world's third largest telescope, which you can see there. So it's quite an incredible site, and that's quite a unique festival site. Liverpool Sound City, you hear more from my colleague uh, Becky, who's the CEO of Sound City, but it's one of the original multi-venue festivals, it's internationally renowned, it uses a range of venues, it's a showcase festival, so it has a great reputation for showcasing emerging talent, new acts, <laughs> very much want to play this, so you're going to hear a, a lot more um, about that event from, from Becky and the top tips. 
do's and don'ts in a little while. That's in the wrong direction. I go the right way. That's the end of the road. This is, um, it's not so much about the overall experience, it's more of a traditional music festival uh, in Lama Tree Gardens in Dorset, 15,000 capacity. Um, and it has a consistently brilliant and very varied lineup. So the organisers are, are trusted kind of gatekeepers. And that's their golden stage, which I think is one of the most atmospheric and beautiful uh, stages in the, in the UK, one of, one of the nicest arenas. Okay, so we're doing these workshops over the next couple of days here in Moscow. And I just wanted to give a, a little bit of an overview of some of the areas that we're going to be looking at. Um, obviously the challenges of running the festival, we could talk for an hour, two hours, three hours about just this topic. Um, but some of the top, you know, some of the factors are finding the right site, that, is, that remains the most crucial thing. Managing the site, event management planning, logistics, safety planning, budgeting successfully, on-site operations, production, choosing suppliers and contractors, negotiating with them, risk assessments, ticketing, marketing, promotion, making sure that you do that effectively so that you actually sell tickets and that you have a, a viable event. Um, booking artists, dealing with agents, consulting with residents, um, considering accessibility, crowd management, traffic management, waste management, sustainability, sponsorship, traders, planning, and particularly in the UK it's important to plan for bad weather, um, having strategies around crime and disorder and noise in areas like that, liaising with authorities, exercising due diligence. So the list goes on and on and on and that's just a few kind of off, off the top of my head really but all of that is sits within the job of a festival promoter, which is why it's uh, you know very stressful but rewarding job to have. Um, as I said, with city-based festivals, it's it's not necessarily straightforward. It may seem so because you don't have to build the temporary infrastructure, but in fact, you're dealing with a lot of those factors I've just mentioned. But you're also dealing with a lot of different venues, different licenses. You've got to build positive partnerships with each venue and you have less control over each arena of your festival arguably so it comes with its, with its own challenges really um, and I'm sure Becky would attest to that. <laughs> I would argue that the key thing irrespective of whether it's a city based festival or greenfield is having a unique concept for the festival. So in the UK there are almost a thousand festivals more and more, you know, arguments around the market being saturated, etc. It's more important than ever to have that idea that makes your festival stand out, and that's the key question you should be asking yourself at the very beginning um, if you don't have a strong concept. Building a team. I just want to touch upon the different roles because. I think people can assume that, you know, festival promoter or director is the job, but there's actually so many other roles and jobs going to deliver an event. Um, that's a picture of the Lama Tree Festival team. Um, and that's a relatively small festival. Obviously it's smaller festivals the promoter takes on a lot of different roles. Uh, the promoter is responsible for the licensing, the overall operations, um, success of delivery of the event, bookings, conceptual elements. You might employ a separate festival booker to deal with agents and negotiate and come in on budget. Um, obviously artists are making ever more money out of live rather than recorded um, and the agents there to try and maximise that, that fee. Um, Live is undoubtedly the, the key income stream for the vast majority of artists now, so that's important. Also having a good production manager or production company, however you approach that, 
that's then broken down into other roles like site manager and stage manager, production assistant, artist liaison, uh, etc. Uh, so the production company liaises with the two managers and technical riders, uh, lighting, audio, uh, backdrops, equipment hire, backline, etc. You might have a trader manager to deal with the, um, the food concessions. And food's increasingly an important part of the offering at festivals, part of the overall experience now as well. Um, you probably have a bar operator. I mean, if you can do that yourself, then I would recommend doing it because there's, there can be some money made there and those ancillary forms of revenue are important. Uh, but particularly in a large scale festival, it requires a lot of expertise to operate the bars. So most people would use an external provider. And then artist liaison, that's how a lot of people that I know, including myself, started in the industry. Uh, you're dealing with catering riders and transportation and things like that. And it's a good um, it's a good way to gain insight into all of the other roles. Um, and it can be quite fun as well, although it's, it depends on the artist, you know, because I've worked at festivals where you've got kind of Iggy Pop or Grace Jones or someone like that, and the riders can be quite demanding um, and very specific. <laughs> so it depends on who the artist is. And then beyond that, you've got a huge temporary workforce, festivals, volunteers, waste collection, stewards, car parking, etc., etc. So that hopefully gives you some insight into some of the different roles involved in, in building the team. In terms of the financial model, I mean, to be honest with you, it, it doesn't make much sense on paper to do a festival, you know, looking at it from a purely economic point of view. Um, it's incredibly high risk, it's competitive, and um, it's on an economic tightrope, you know, you're probably not going to yield immense profits in, in your first year. And it's a long-term commitment, it can take several years to break even. Um, margins are very tight, overall infrastructure costs and artist fees are going up continually. Um, and these events are structured very differently to concerts, if you think about it, your entire business is dependent on a two to three day event going well, going successfully. You know, one bad year can, can destabilize. And there's other market factors. The weather, um, whatever's going on in the wider economy can, can all have an effect. So it is risky and you do need to think about ancillary revenue streams to pop it up, whether it's bars, catering, merchandise, whatever that is. Um, but on the other hand, they're increasingly more festivals, so obviously some promoters are doing it right and, and taking a long-term view. I just wanted to talk a little bit about marketing, promotion and PR. Um, it's such an important topic that we're spending an entire day on it. And these, these workshops um, on Sunday, we're spending the entire day on this. Obviously it's fundamental to festivals. Increasingly with technology and social media and an increasingly connected world, I think marketing is a, a year-round conversation, a dialogue with your audiences. It's, it's simply not enough to put a show on sale and say, here you go, go buy some tickets please, there's a lineup. You've got to be smarter than that. There's so many platforms You've got to think about your online marketing, you've got to think about your offline and physical, experiential marketing, more traditional marketing. <laughs> um, and this is the area where it's a real opportunity for festivals to build a, a visual world around their theme and their, and their concepts and their identity and to get people excited enough to actually purchase a ticket. And it's not always complicated, but you do have to be creative and stand out. Um, you can achieve incredible results on, on no budget as well, if, if you are creative enough. Uh, this is a picture from um, a festival called Kendall Colin in the Lake District. And um, several years ago they staged this, um, this kind of stunt where 
they asked people to come to the festival dressed as Superman, and they actually broke the uh, <laughs> world record for the amount of people dressed as Superman at one time. Uh, I mean, it may sound like a bit of a kind of uh, potentially kind of silly thing to do, but um, it's a great image, and as a result of that, it got it got the global media attention um, after the event. So, in, in terms of you know, obviously it's after the event, but it's still powerful in terms of enhancing their reputation, and it's just a fun a fun story as well. You know, it makes people want to get involved and find out what that festival is. So Festival Futures, where, where do we go from here? I mean, in the UK there's a lot of festivals, as I mentioned, the market is arguably saturated. Um, but personally I'm optimistic. I think as long as promoters have great ideas and unique sites um, and great concepts and are willing to take risks and commit long term, that fantastic events will continue to be produced. Well, we'll see boundaries being posted, creative production, more city-based festivals, um, as you have here in Russia. And I'm looking forward to finding out more about festivals in Russia over the next couple of days as well. So it's, it's generally unwise to predict the future in any way, but I feel quite hopeful about the future of the independent sector and about festivals in, in general. Um, so I'm going to hand over to my colleague in a moment, but I just wanted to, um, to finish on a, a David Bowie quote, which I think is relevant to trying to predict the future. And that it's, tomorrow belongs to those who can hear it come out. Spasibo, thank you for listening. Thank you very much um, everyone for being here this evening. It's an absolute pleasure for me to be here in Moscow. Um, I'm really passionate um, about Russian history and Russian literature and this is my first time in Russia so I'm really, really excited to be here and it's a really um, great honour to be able to talk to you all as um, people that are really interested in and already getting involved in putting on festivals. So as Paul said, and thank you Paul, that was a really great overview of what festivals are like in the UK and it was really interesting for me to hear as well. Um, but I'm just going to run through um, some do's and don'ts about putting on um, festivals, particularly city centre based ones, because that's where um, I have the most experience with the festival that I run. So um, I basically, um, I'm, I'm the Chief Operating Officer, which basically means I'm the General Manager for um, a festival in the UK called Sound City, which takes place every year in Liverpool. Um, Sound City is an independent festival for new music. So every year we have around 300 new bands that come to play in, at the festival in Liverpool. And they come from all over the world. So we've had um, bands from Russia, we've had Mummy Troll before, um, a band called Cats Park from Moscow a few years ago, and we've had bands like Ed Sheeran and Florence and the Machine and uh, the 1975 Bastille. Um, loads and loads of new artists that have basically come to play at Sound City when they're really, really new and small, and then they go on to bigger and better things. So um, we basically say that we're the UK's leading independent festival for new music. Let me see if I can get into these. Um, so yeah, so every year we have um, 20,000 music fans that come to our festival over three days um, and we have 2,000 industry professionals that come as well because we also run a music business conference that we do to attract um, people that are in the profession as labels, artist managers, um, booking agents, promoters and anybody that's interested in getting into the music business or people that are operating in the music business. And we've run Sound City now since 2008 and um, we've been, ever, ever since that date we've been building up the audience and building up who we work with. So let me go back to this one. Oh, sorry. Um, 
So yeah, so a little bit before I said who, are, who am I. Um, as in my job every day, I basically manage all of the events that we do. So I manage the event we do in Liverpool, Liverpool Sound City, and we also run events in China and um, South Korea. And um, we do an event in Manchester every year as well, which also celebrates emerging talent. And in my day-to-day -day role, I look after managing all the teams that do the booking for the festival, um, I, manage it, I manage our marketing team, our production team, and our sponsorship team. And my main role is making sure that everything runs smoothly and that I help to um, address any problems and that um, I also help out with the sponsorship that we bring in for the festival as well. Ah, so basically, what I've put together is a few top tips and a few do's and don'ts of, of running a successful festival. Now, first of all, I think one of the key things that Paul alluded to in his um, presentation just now is about having a very, very strong concept and vision for your festival. Um, as Paul was saying before, it's a very, very crowded marketplace now for festivals. Certainly in, in the UK it is, and I know that um, there's so much live music and so many live music events in Russia as well. I think um, you can't just think about a festival as being the only thing that's competing for people's attention. It's also you're competing for people's time in other areas of entertainment as well because people are spending money and time on things like um, movies, and they're watching TV, they're playing games, they're on Facebook, they're doing all sorts of things that compete for their time. So you can't just rely on the fact that um, you're going to be competing for people's attention as they're going to festivals. It's also about other types of entertainment as well. When you're defining a concept for your festival, you always need to think about what exactly who who are the audience that you're going to attract for it. So, at Sound City, we focus on being a festival to discover new music, and we say that um, Sound City is where you'll find the best new bands that you've never ever heard yet. So we always tell people that they'll go on a journey of discovery with the festival and as a result we attract a lot of people from all different ages that are interested in new music and it basically by having that goal and having that central viewpoint it helps us to define who we are so I think one of the key things that you should think about when starting off is always think about who your festival is aimed at. I mean, it, it might be a genre-based festival, you might be aimed at dance music fans, would it be metal fans, it could, is it family friendly, is it 18 plus, um, does it have other types of entertainment as well? And that's a really key thing to start from because you have to know and envisage the type of people that are going to be going to your festival. The second point I wanted to make, um, number two, is um, give yourself lots of time to plan. Um, I think one of the things that um, is quite daunting when you first put a festival on is, is actually thinking about how long and how much time that you actually need to do it. Um, the key th one of the key things to do in the first instance is to create an event plan and make a timeline. So work back from the date that you set your festival. So if you, for example, if you set your festival um, for July and work back from that date and then keep thinking what am I going to be doing in that week before and the week before that and I think I always say that when I'm doing when I first started doing South City it was such a scary thing to do and me and my team always said that from, from day one when we started doing it even if we'd had a thousand years to plan the festival we still would have needed an extra week because it's always the case that you feel that you're running out of time so it's just key that you have a strong event plan and that really just comes into force when you work out exactly kind of the team that you're going to need and as Paul was saying before it's really it's really important that you um, think about where your income for the festival is going to come from so there's all sorts of considerations to think of with that. Ticket sales is one of the key income areas for um, creating a festival. And there's also sponsorship, um, things like funding and investment and crowdfunding. You need to think about how much your tickets will cost. Um, the ticket price will always be determined by your overall budget and how much you need to make to cover your costs. And 
then the cost itself, which range from things like artists, production, um, marketing, exter um, staff that you might bring in to run the festival. And there's always um, this, all of this stuff, it seems a bit daunting when you first think about it, but there are so many good checklists. Um, sorry, so many good checklists and templates online for this kind of thing. There's lots of um, resources on um, ticket sites like Eventbrite, they have really good ones. And um, AIF, I think, have got some free resources as well, haven't they, on the website that can help you with that kind of thing as well. Um, the, second, the third um, key thing that I think is important is um, one of the really key things is do get all your local venues and suppliers on board to ensure success. As I said, I'm talking really about city centre-based festivals where you have lots and lots of stakeholders involved. So when you're running a city centre-based festival, you're, you're dealing with lots and lots of different venues and you've got all the different personalities of the different venue owners and the different licensing um, restrictions that they might have and the way that they like to do things. It's also really essential to work with your local community. Um, there are things like noise complaints from local residents that can get festivals closed down. And so it's really key that you, when we first started doing South City, we went to all the residents in our local area, and we still do, where we write them a letter and we tell them we're going to be putting the festival on. And sometimes it takes things like giving people free tickets to attend the festival. Um, that can really help, um, to, because as long as you've got the local community on board and they're really happy that you're doing the festival, um, that's one of the key things to make it run smoothly. I think one of the things with working with venues as well is to manage their expectations from day one. And so when you're speaking to venues, don't be afraid to have conversations with them on things like noise and access and whether they're going to be the ones to clean up litter. They'll always be glad to help if they know that you're straight up with them and that you are very honest with them from the start. It's always really important as well when you're dealing with venues to get agreements in writing. Um, in the early days we had to um, end up painting the floor of the venue afterwards um, after we finished using it because um, we hadn't got that agreed on this before with the lady that was running it. So there are things that can pop up if you don't kind of agree everything from the outset. Um, local venues, suppliers and restaurants are really, really good ways to promote your festival. So it's really important to, get, to maintain good relationships with them as well. Um, at South City, we're based in Liverpool in a very urban area. So we speak to local restaurants and cafes and we always ask them if they can offer discounts and in return they help promote Sound City and that always helps with the overall atmosphere of the festival and makes the community appreciate it even more and it's great for businesses from outside the city too as they like to be able to sample what Liverpool has to offer and not just the music. So number four is do get the right permits in place. Um, if your festival has been held on public land, you'll always probably need a permit or a license from the city. Um, sometimes if you're in a private venue as well, you might need a license if your festival is going on after hours. Um, you should always check in advance and at the beginning of planning your festival what you need um, and make sure you've got the right licenses in place because there is absolutely nothing worse than setting up a really amazing event or festival um, and then having it shut down because you've gone on after hours and you don't have the right license. In Liverpool there was a really successful dance music promoter who got shut down because they didn't have the right license So, um, and they lost a lot of money as a result. So it's one of the things that you need to get right from the early site, the early doors. Um, oh. Number five I think is the last do and then I come into the dose. Sorry. Um, so do um, do work out your total artist budget and stick to it. Um, it's really important that you set out um, from the start with a budget for the artists that you want to have, but um, because it's really really easy to get carried away when you've got really exciting um, and big and well-known artists that um, is being offered and then to actually absolutely blow your budget on them. 
um, agents that look after artists will often negotiate very, very hard to get the best fee to their artists. And if you're not careful, um, you can end up finding that you're paying over what you can afford. I've, there's a few promoters that I know um, in Liverpool that have done that. And we've actually, one of our bookers recently paid to, went over our budget for the artists with an artist that was over our budget. And I was really, really cross with him because I told him that I'd already told him not to go over the budget. And so, um, so it's really important, as I said, agents are always there to get the best price for the artist and they want the artist to get the most money. So it's really important that you stick, stay your ground with them and if they're trying to get more money out of you that you t um, just walk away if it's too much over your budget. Also, if you get one huge um, star artist that uses up your whole budget, then you might struggle to keep all the audiences entertained for the whole festival. So, I th so uh, one of the really great things about creating a good atmosphere and kind of creating a brand for your festival is to get lots of new and exciting emerging artists onto the bill. So, for example, with Sound City we have artists that come from all over the world and a lot of them are the ones now that people want to go and see because they love it if they can go and see a really exciting metal band from Lithuania or a really amazing um, electro band from Russia or an exciting hip-hop artist from China. And it's those kind of things that, um, you know, that don't have to cost a massive amount, but they can really make the festival exciting. Um, I think one of the key things as well is to check what size shows your bigger name artists have played before and whether they've sold out. We often get offered artists in Liverpool that are really expensive, but we know they're not going to do the tickets. Um, for example, there's a band in the UK called Old J who have got a really high fee and we know that if we put them in Liverpool that we just wouldn't sell the amount of tickets for them. So you have to be really wary of how much agents actually want, to, um, want you to pay for artists and you have to think about um, whether, whether they're actually going to be um, an artist that will sell well for you. And there are ways that you can do that um, which I will come on to in the dopes that I'll go through in a minute. Yeah, it's really important to check um, whether artists have sold out the, the shows that they've done recently, because that will tell you, tell you a lot about whether they're going to do well for you as well, and make sure that they're not um, playing too, too close to where your festival is. I think one of the things that I learned really early on when I was doing South City was um, don't basically don't do it all yourself. I think one of the tempting things when you start out as a um, as running running a festival yourself is trying to do everything. So, for example, when we started, I tried to do a lot of things myself, and I would try be trying to run production or try to book all the hotels. Um, I I ended up cleaning and. Painting out, painting the whole venue in the early days, and that took the ages. And I realised then that that was best done by paid professionals. Sometimes you might not have the budget to get everyone in place, but if you're really passionate about what you're doing, you'll often attract people that want to give time to your project as well. And I think one of the key things, and this is what Paul said before about being in a team, is playing to your strengths and thinking about how much time different ta tasks will take you to do. So, for example, your, you, your time is probably spe better spent marketing your event, which is, something, which is something you can learn to do by copying other festivals, rather than learning all about sound tech and production. Um, there's things that you can outsource, and it's better to outsource what, what you can't do, and um, learn to look to work with people that share your vision and want to get involved for little or no money in the early days, and who have different skills to yourself. The other thing that's, um, with, that's really good that we've done for a long time is we've, we have a really big volunteer program. So we have lots of people that come and work with us for a very um, for the three days of the festival, and we always make sure that um, we give them a reference afterwards so that they can go and use their skills in other areas of the industry. And we've worked with a lot of volunteers that have gone on to work in much bigger roles with us. So it's a really good way of getting people. Um, to you know, to show what they can do before you start to work with them before for, um, full time. Number seven. Don't rely on one source of income. 
I think one of the key things to do when starting out is to make sure you spread the risk of um, yeah, make sure you spread the risk of what you're doing across different income streams. For example, um, your ticket sales um, will always be determined by the level of artists and entertainment that you have and the budget that you have for the festival. So the higher profile the entertainment, the higher the value you carry the ticket generally, and that will help determine your ticket price. Um, there's lots of things. There's, we work with a really big range of sponsors um, at Sam City. So we work with cash sponsors like Heineken, um, Red Bull and Jack Daniels. Um, we do work with Deezer and they will offer the cash in return for branding at the festival and they do activations that look about things like free drinks and headphones sometimes as well. Um, there are other kinds of sponsorships as well that you can do. So you can do in-kind in sponsorships which the ones, for example, um, we work with Marshall Amps, and they offer lots of amps for the emerging artists to play um, at, on at the festival, and then in return we give them branding. And that's something that's really good, because it's something that we then don't have to pay for. But the important thing is to always weigh up brands who offer you in-kind support for something you don't have in budget. For example, we get lots of companies offering us streaming, in return for branding and often the cost that they're offering and what they want in return is a lot higher than what um, we have in budget. So you have to always think, is this actually going to be something that's really useful to me or not? When you consider those kind of in-kind deals. Um, one of the other areas that um, you can get income streams for as well in the UK is through um, funding. So we have, we're in the UK we have um, some, some city councils that offer funding for putting on festivals. There's a lot of towns now that will get a bit of money to help um, put the festival on because it showcases the town and brings lots of tourism in. Um, there's also arts foundations that we have in the UK. Um, we get some support every year from the Arts Council England because we do a lot of work to help emerging artists to develop and we always get we always have to deliver, if we get funding from them, we always have to deliver um, a service to them in return. So we always make sure that the money that we spend is on the artists themselves and on helping um, to make the experience better for them. If you are applying for funding, it's always important to check the criteria for funding to make sure that what you're doing um, and what you're applying for isn't a waste of time for you and that it's actually something you're eligible for. And um, check the deadlines as well, because most funders won't um, fund anything that's already happened. Um, when we started Sam City um, back in 2008, we aimed for 50% ticket sales, 25% sponsors and 25% funders to spread the risk. And that can vary, but it's always worth trying to have, it, have some backup of income so that you don't put all of, the, um, all of your faith and risk into just ticket sales, for example. how much marketing you need to do for your festival, especially if yours is a new event, you need to establish it. Um, don't assume that people will know what you're doing and who you are just from putting your events online and putting your tickets on sale. Um, it's really important, I think, as Paul was saying before, it's a year-round thing um, when you're marketing and you have to have a conversation with people that are buying tickets all the time. So we do a lot of our marketing through um, social media now. Um, when we started in 2008, we used to mostly do post advertising, and that's kind of switched now to be about 75% of our budget goes to online marketing. Um, it's a really good way of doing it because with Facebook and with Instagram particularly, you can um, track exactly where your ads are being seen, you can see exactly who's clicked on your Facebook ad and if that's led to a direct ticket sale. So it's a really, really cost-effective way of doing it and it's um, a way of reaching a lot of very targeted audiences because you can put in, you can say I want to target back, um, people that love Queens of the Stone Age, that live in Liverpool, that like eating um, chicken or something like that. It's just it's very, very specific how you can market using Facebook. Um, 
copy what you see other festivals doing. I think that's one of the really, really key and easy things to do. It's look at what you see um, other festivals doing with their marketing and see how they're doing it. Look at the way that they're launching their tickets. Um, look at the way that they're um, reaching out to their fans and the kind of um, you know, viral marketing that they might be doing. It's really, it's, a, it's something that's quite underutilised, I think, but it's a really, really important way of learning what works and what doesn't work. Um, get all people to opt in across your social media as well and get them onto your email list. If you've got an email list that you can send um, targeted mail apps out with information and news about your festivals, then that is a great way of doing it because you get a lot more room to do that than you do on a small Facebook post. And there's really good tools like MailChimp that are very good for doing it, and it's very, it's quite an easy and cheap thing to do. Um, one of the key things as well is online ticket sellers. Um, so ones like Ticketmaster, for example, we have C tickets in the UK are essential to manage ticket sales. They'll basically manage all of the ticketing and the fulfillment, and they're also fantastic marketing tools because if you work with a ticket reseller, say for example Ticketmaster or any of the others, they have massive databases and lists of people that are interested in festivals and they will help spread the word um, and they will send out mail outs because they want to sell tickets on your behalf. Um, the other thing that's really a good, a good thing and not to be underestimated is um, working with your venues, working with your artists and working with your sponsors to promote your um, festival as well. Um, we find that now that about we we've kind of really re really recently realised how much our sponsors do for us in terms of marketing, and I think um, it's something that aside from just giving us money, they're really brilliant to expand your audience reach. Again, if you um, artists as well will always be happy to promote your event if um, they know that there's going to be more people coming to see them and you can often um, be, be able to send um, targeted messages out from their Facebook pages and get access to um, their databases as well. So again, it's all about um, maintaining and building those relationships so that you can do that. Don't forget to do your market research. Um, it's a really, really key thing um, to do from the outset and when you start out. Um, check what other events are going on at the same time in your city and area. There's so many times when I, I know that I've had people, um, people that have told me there's another event on um, at a similar time to another event that they want to go to. And we recently, in the last couple of years, clashed with another really, um, really close event to Sound City as well. And don't clash with events that are similar to you and where your audience might be. For example, in the UK, people don't put festivals on the same weekend as Glastonbury because it's such a massive event and they know that people are just, you know, they want to, even if they're not going to Glastonbury, they'll be watching it on the TV. Um, but then also sometimes that can play slightly differently. Um, for example, if your festival is made aimed mainly at a local audience, um, then similar events in different regions shouldn't affect you. For example, in the UK there's a festival that's on at the same time as South City called Live at Leeds, but it's 160 kilometres away, so we don't have the same audience as them, and it doesn't really detract from what we do. And sometimes we will share artists with them and we'll share the feed of artists if they go and play in Leeds and in Liverpool. So it can work to an advantage. Um, and don't book headline artists who have recently played in your area because this can really affect ticket sales. Um, if an artist has played too recently, people won't want to go and see them again, so they won't buy a ticket to a festival. We have a rule that um, at Sound City that our headline artists have not played within three months and within a 150 mile radius of Liverpool. And we put that into all our artist contracts so that the agents, when they're booking them, can't go against that rule. So that's a really important um, thing that in the past we had a couple of artists who were playing at um, quite festivals that are quite near to Sound City and that did affect our sales quite a bit.
finally, um, don't forget to enjoy putting on your festival. Um, remember always why you wanted to do it in the first place. Um, putting on a festival is a massive um, task and it's something that you need to be really passionate about um, if you're going to really throw yourself into it to do it. And remember as well, until you turn your event into a full-time business, it's going, it is going to be your most time-consuming hobby, so it's going to be something that's going to take a lot of time. But it's at the same time, as much as I'm saying that, and I don't say, I don't say that necessarily to put you off doing it, but there's so many rewarding things about putting on a festival. And I think some of the things that can sort of fly by, because when you're in the moment of actually putting the festival together, it was really, really um, just going an absolute flash. So take time for the festival to stand back and enjoy the fact that you're doing something that you love. Because I think there's nothing better than watching a festival full of people having fun and you sit then they're thinking that I did this or we did this more importantly because you're always in a team. So Spasiva, um, thank you for listening. Друзья, может быть, к вопросам перейдем? Давайте поднимайте руки, я буду. Hi, Rebecca. My question is for you. Welcome to Moscow. Hope you will enjoy the time. Uh, I'm representing the local band. I'm the manager. And um, I have a, such a strict question to you. Um, you said about the expression of the band on your festival that you should impress the audience with a Chinese hip hop band, etc. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, how do you relate with the uh, international artists? And uh, what are you looking at first? Maybe the digital publicity, I don't know, video clips on YouTube or just something like that. That's my question. Well, we really love having international artists at Sound City because um, over the years we've made the international artists that we book one of the really big features of what we do with the festival. And so we have an open application process and anyone from anywhere in the world can apply to play at the festival. Now, that means that we do get a lot of people applying um, and so we we make sure that we listen to every single artist and we try to watch if we can as artists as well. Um, if possible, I would like to see an artist in, if I can in person or get one of my team to see them. That's not always possible if, you know, if for example, you're the other side of the world. So what we're always looking for is good, um, a really, really strong, um, you know, an EPK we call it, so have really, really strong live videos, have a really, really, really good recorded two or three tracks that we can listen to. Um, the social profiles are not as important because sometimes bands can um, inflate them, they can increase them themselves. So what we tend to do is we speak to trusted people we know in those countries, so we speak to um, promoters that we know we to say Russia to say, do you know this band? Are they the band that you think uh, as you've come across before? And then some of that will be part of our consideration. But then we also are looking at whether the band is active, so if they're touring, if they're doing things in their own country, if they're promoting themselves, if they're inviting, you know, you can see that there's lots of it's more important that there's lots of activity on their social profiles than that they've got, say, 10,000 fans. But we can see that they've got a good dialogue with who their community is, and that's the more important thing. So it's lots of different factors to it in consideration, but we want to also know that the band, if it comes to the UK, will take advantage of that opportunity and that they'll appeal to the UK audiences. So we just, um, you know, so from that we, we do that through just really reading through their profile and seeing why they need to come and looking, you know, through their live performances. 
So, but yeah, if you're in the band, you should be able to give me some music, so I'm definitely do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Тут еще? Здравствуйте, я продолжу по-русски. Ребекка, Пол, добрый вечер. Я хочу продолжить тему спонсора. Когда мы в России собираемся организовывать какое-то событие и приходим к нашим потенциальным спонсорам с коммерческим предложением, а мы всегда, это одна из последних тенденций, стремимся представить их так, что они могут выступить экспертами в своей области перед аудиторией, которая придет в наш фестиваль. И также мы стараемся интегрировать спонсоров в какие-то интерактивные истории, чтобы целевая аудитория также повзаимодействовала с этим спонсором. Скажите, пожалуйста, каким образом вы убеждаете ваших потенциальных партнеров, спонсоров, почему они должны принять участие и проспонсировать ваши мероприятия? Какие у вас ключевые есть моменты убеждения? Спасибо большое. Thank you. Um, I think the whole nature of sponsorship has changed really. Um, it's evolved far beyond putting a logo on a poster or having some kind of blend, kind of branding. Um, that doesn't really work anymore. I think the best uh, kind of sponsorships at festivals are woven into the experience and they just naturally feel part of that world. And I think that's ultimately what a sponsor is looking for at a festival, is to be connected to that cool experience, you know, with that, with that sort of demographic um, people attending festivals, to have, to have influence in that environment. And certainly some of the sponsorship that I've seen at, at festivals recently, you don't even realise, it doesn't really feel like marketers are not sponsorship. It's, it's just there. Um, so, for example, at Boomtown Fair, it feels like there isn't much sponsorship there. But but then you're in, um, you know, they, they have an area they call the Wild West, where you're in a sort of town and they have a whiskey bar. And of course, the, the whiskey is provided by one particular company. Um, and, and obviously, they they are a sponsor. <laughs> um, but it isn't. It isn't obvious and blatant in, in the way that I think corporate sponsorship um, previously was. I, I think certainly in the UK, a lot of bigger brands, is it fair to say, they've moved away from festivals a little bit. Um, it's harder to, to get that money. Um, obviously, it's important it, it can prop up uh, your festival. It, it's very important. Um, Hugh, you've got some, something to add to that. It's a really good question that you asked because um, we are quite a small festival at the South City. We have um, 20,000 people over three days, which is a lot smaller than, say, big festivals like Reading and Leeds, which are about 100,000 in Glastonbury. But we have still managed to get some really good great sponsors like Red Bull and Heineken um, and Jack Daniels. As Paul said, it's they're coming, because there's a lot of festivals now, it's becoming harder and harder to convince sponsors that um, they should choose your festival. But a lot of the time it's about just building the relationship with that sponsor. So at the end of the day, a lot of time people give to people, so it will be the relationship you have with the brand manager of that sponsor, where you can t tell them exactly who your audience are. And you can say to them, we're going to be able to help you to reach this audience at the festival, but also around the festival. So we can offer you like targeted competition opportunities, different um, social engagement. We can offer you um, branding and marketing in the lead up to the festival and after the festival. Because they always want to be present everywhere and they also want to know that at the end of the day, a lot of the time, if there's a jeans sponsor, they want to be selling lots of jeans, or there's beer, they want to sell lots of beer. So they just want to know that they can get as many eyeballs onto, that, onto their product as possible. 
So if you can offer them done that not just at the festival but in the lead up through your marketing and maybe through you know, for example we had um, Red Bull that came and did some gigs, some concerts in the lead up to Town City with us as well as they paid for. So that helped them to increase the reach of it. But a lot of the time it's just getting to know the person that is running that campaign and then just being able to have a really strong idea of who your um, who your audience is and you know, to tell them a bit of a profile about that person that you know is the target for their um, brand. Здравствуйте. Вопрос такой. Вопрос. Участники, которые принимают участие в ваших фестивалях, после участия они получают какой-нибудь бэкграунд в качестве ротации на радиостанции, в качестве ротации клипов, либо подписания каких-то контрактов? И если участник занял, допустим, гран-при или первое место, на следующий фестиваль он приглашается. Спасибо. And we give them that so they can share it. Um, we also um, do targeted posts about them. We do a link to the include in the contracts with the artists. And this is not just um, something that we do, but it's something we expect the artists to do as well. And in the artist contract, we say we want you to do at least, say, 10 Instagram posts. We want you to do at least 10 Facebook, 10 Twitter, 10 Snapchat. Um, we want you to share all of these announcements and it's something that we request to see up from the artists as part of them playing at the festival. But for the artists, yes, we, uh, it's great if artists want to do interviews, if they want to do radio, if they want to do um, even TV or anything like that. So if artists really want to do that because they're playing the festival, we will get them involved in it and we had artists playing on like rides with sponsor activations and had a big boat that had um, like a rum bar on it and we had um, some of the new artists playing on that boat and they got lots of the big rums, for example. So if the artists are happy to be um, participating in everything that we do, then we will give them as much as we can in return. And if they're, for us, if an artist is one that is just, um, we, will, we won't book the same artist the next year unless we know their profile has grown and it means that there's a reason to put them on, say, a bigger stage. Also, there's another reason to put them on. So it, it really depends on that happening for us to want to bring them back again. But if they do, then we have had artists that have played over a few years and every time they played on a small stage and a big stage and a headline stage, for example, and that's always great to trust you for Chelsea. And I think following up from that, I mean, I would say festivals are amazing incubators of new talent. Um, so festivals like Sound City, many of our other members, you know, some of them are some of them are as high as eighty-five percent emerging artists, relatively unknown. Um, in that environment, audiences are far more open to new artists, new experiences. They're there for the festival as an overall experience, so they're more open to music discovery. Whereas if they're going to a concert, it's a bit more of a prescriptive experience because you bought that ticket for that artist. You might not see the support band, but at festivals where you have multiple stages, and artists across all of them, you can reach a, a lot of new fans that way. Um, and yeah, without the, the grassroots festivals, um, you wouldn't have the huge headliners because all of them, without exception, started playing gigs there and kind of honed their craft at, at those events. And, and as Becky said, there's a sense of development in larger stages hopefully to eventually headline. Um, 
And I actually think the ultimate objective of a lot of artists has changed. It's not necessarily about getting signed now, it's just about reaching audiences in whichever way that you can. And obviously live and festivals are, are a great vehicle for that. First, I need to say, uh, say no, 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 uh, I need to say a great English, a great Britain accent from you. Thank you very much. We are really loud. It's, it's like a kind of charming. All this when we listen to great English language. I'm actually Russian, so I'm, I'm just putting this this on. This is a fake accent. Thank you very much. And if uh, the, the audience can uh, say thank you, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. And uh, one uh, question, the two questions. Uh, one about uh, the manager. Do you always uh, kind of working only with the established bands, as I saw? In your speech, uh, you must be established in Russia, and that's it. That's the first question. No, it's well. That's one of that's one of the things that we look at. But it, we don't mean that they have to be really famous in Russia. We just mean that we like the band to be doing something. So you might be a band that is maybe playing one one hundred or one hundred and fifty capacity shows in your own hometown, or not hometown, but your local area. So you're but, doing it's all, but it's all about establishing. You only speak to those who are quite big in locals. Yeah, quite big. Not, uh, we don't, yeah. Well, we want an artist that's coming over to play our festival to be one that is already used to being, used to doing touring, for example, okay. is established in what they're doing. They don't have to be really famous at all. Like, for example, there's a few artists that we know from Mo Moscow, like one that's played tomorrow night called Short Paris. Okay. Uh, we really thank you. Like. And uh, next uh, question about your name. Uh, do you have any connections with the US? Uh, touring, uh, you, you took uh, some city. It's uh, the biggest uh, and legendary studio. Oh, yeah, in the US. same world. Yeah. Uh, yeah, speak about it. No, I, we, that's um, a coincidence. No, 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 it's not. <laughs> no, um, in Liverpool, um, sound means cool or good. So when we call it Sound City, we meant it means like good city. Do you have any connections with the US touring management on, on that level? No? Um, we, do, we have done a showcase festival in um, the US before. We take every year, um, until a few years ago, we took artists to South by Southwest and we also did a showcase in New York. So we do have um, connections there, yes, but we don't. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your English. <laughs> Здравствуйте, спасибо вам за доклад ваш. У меня вопрос а, такой. А, каким образом вы получаете доход с баров и а, точек питания? Это какая-то аренда мест, либо кейтинговые компании делятся с вами процентом? Спасибо. Well, we have done it on a few in a few different ways. Um, so we have run our own bars where we've had our own staff and we've bought the beer from a beer supplier. We've set up the bars, we've run it ourselves, um, and we've also done it where we have had an external bar company that's come to um, do the bars at our festival. Um, when we run it ourselves. Um, our staff that we had to do it weren't that good, so we didn't make as much money as we should have done um, from running our own bars. Um, when we brought in, um, when we brought in our own um, bars, no, when we brought in our, our bar op operator, 
um, they actually paid us money to um, do the bar at the festival. So we, they paid us like a sponsorship fee to then sell the beer through the festival and then we got sponsors on board like Heineken and Jack Daniels and others. So there's, I think both of those ways you can make good money but I think from speaking to festival operators that I know that are doing it themselves, I think if you get, get it right and you can run it yourself then you can make, that's the way you can probably make the most money. But it needs to, you need to make sure you have excellent staff and really, really good processes in place to do that because the, the running the bars is all about making sure you serve as quickly as possible and efficiently as possible, really. But Paul, you probably got some examples as well. Yeah, I think, as Becky says, it's, it's the exception rather than the rule for festival to run their own bars. Um, but I know one example I can think of, uh, there's two festivals in the UK called Arc Tangent in 2000 Trees, uh, run by the same small core team, and they invested in buying their bars and all of the infrastructure that, that they needed. Um, and now obviously they have obviously that's an upfront cost, but they've then got the means of production really. And I know that that works very well for them financially. They can move the infrastructure across the two sites because the festivals don't happen simultaneously. They're at different points in the summer. So they can do that and I know it's that's that's worthwhile for them certainly. But I think as Becky said, it's about having the right staff and the right expertise and I think at larger scale festivals um, it is often easier to outsource and just get a certain guaranteed amount of money rather than take the risk yourself. Um, I think another point is that you often don't know with, with food traders for example you often don't entirely you might not 100% know how much business they're, they're doing so I know for example one festival in the UK um, that uses cashless technology, like wristband, RFID technology. Um, so they have the data on sales uh, for their, their food concessions. And the first year they, they did that, um, there was a, like a, a truck selling grilled cheese and it was making like £20,000 over the weekend and they were paying the festival a thousand pounds. So, time to renegotiate, right? But without that data, it, it's a difficult conversation to have. There's obviously a lot of trust in, involved there. Um, so, I, I think that, that's important as well, negotiating the right deals. Obviously though, food traders are, are small, independent businesses in themselves, and you want to support them, and, they're taking a risk as well because, you know, if you have a bad weekend and the attendance isn't good, then they're not going to do good business either. So I think the best festivals approach it like that as a partnership. We're going into this risk together, let's support each other, let's be honest and transparent, and let's both hopefully make some money at the end of it. Добрый вечер, меня зовут Андрей. Спасибо за интересный рассказ и краски презентации. Позволю себе отпустить два вопроса. Поскольку мы все-таки находимся в бизнес-школе, это вопросы больше о бизнесе. Соответственно, вопрос первый. Когда те фестивали, те независимые цветанские фестивали, о которых вы говорите, прежде всего, да, о которых вы говорите, Это прежде всего бизнес-проект или это что-то другое? Какой, какова основная цель этих фестивалей и фактически как такой является основной критерий, по которому оценивается успешность этого проекта? И сразу на второй вопрос. Те люди, которые делают эти фестивали, команды фестивалей, да? Мы все, в общем-то, работаем в фестивальной среде и понимаем, что есть люди, которые, малая часть людей, которые делают фестиваль, проект в течение длительного времени, да, и есть та часть людей, которая привлекается на краткосрочный период. 
Соответственно, насколько для этих двух групп людей важно иметь, скажем так, профессиональное образование именно в этой среде, или фестивальный менеджмент, или близкий к этому, и для обеих групп, насколько это важно. Good question. Thank you very much. Um, just to answer the first one, I'd say certainly with um, AIF members that they are commercial events, so they are a, a business project. Um, they don't always break even in the first year, but there's a longer term strategy. Um, sometimes it can take three or four years. Uh, that said, some members did start just as parties. Um, they started in gardens, in fields, small gatherings, and evolved quite naturally and organically. And I think what you find um, with most events is that the team around it becomes professional, professionalized as the event develops, because they're taking on more responsibilities and they have to think about a load of different things that they didn't when they were starting out. Um, most of them do start small, which I think is very wise to test the waters, you know. Do you, do you have an audience? There's no point thinking you're going to be Glastonbury in your first year. Um, because, you know, I've seen examples of events set out to try and do that and then end up not even happening and being taken off set, which is unfortunate, but it, it's competitive, really. And, it is kind of, it's like any other business in that it's survival of the fittest. Um, you know, you have to have a unique concept and a strong business model in order for your event to be, to be sustainable. So. Yeah, I think um, the first question, um, when we started doing it, we did it because we really were passionate about artists that were in Liverpool and Manchester because we thought some of the best music that had ever been made was coming out from Liverpool and Manchester and that was one of the reasons why we started doing it in the first place. But we always set out that it would be a business and that our main sort of focus would be on emerging artists and we were lucky that at that time that was something that was of interest to our local community of people that were coming to buy tickets and then our international community that come to our industry conference as well and over the years we've built our city so we don't just do our festival in Liverpool we also run training and, and events throughout the year to people that want to get into the music business and we run other events too, um, which are about um, helping artists to develop run other events internationally and to have year-round operations so we have year-round staff and this back kind of goes into your other question about um, the difference in full-time staff and freelance staff or people that are subcontractors. I think as Paul was saying a lot of the people that I work with now they started when we were really really new we're quite a small team we have like five full-time staff and there was five of us um, three of us were there from the start and we've sort of grown up and we've learned the mistakes along the way um, and, then, and then we've tried at times bringing in external production companies and they often come with a much bigger cost and they can be really good but we've actually found now that there's um, a couple of staff that we have that have just become really, really good at production and we find it better to work with them because we can get them involved in lots of projects around the year and it makes more business sense for us to have them working with us full time. But I think if for freelance people that are specialists in festivals, um, if you're really good as a production manager or you're a really good artist liaison, then you'll always find work because there's lots and lots of festivals that need it now and festivals always need good people. So there's lots of artists with liaison people and production people that tend to get work all the time just because they're so good and they are really in demand. And I think, yeah, it's, it's a very small world as well, so once you're kind of established, then word of mouth and recommendations, uh, team members tend to move just across the summer between different festivals, 
and because those skills and expertise and experience are are in demand, um, and it's a relatively it's a relatively small pool of people, isn't it? Really? Hello, sir. I have a couple. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you. And the first one sounds like, uh, what kind of, how do they usually like uh, conditions of sponsors, which included in, inside of the contract? In what part of a contract they are you interested in? And the second is, how do you usually set up uh, contacts with them? Also, is that the contracts that we give to sponsors? Yes. During the process when you are doing the So, with sponsor contracts, um, there's, there, there, we kind of went with a template that we had from another festival. Um, we, it was a festival that we knew, and, we, and they said to us, oh, we'll give you an example of your, our sponsor contract. Um, I think there's lots of different sponsor contracts available that you can find on the internet that are quite useful, but it's always worth getting them checked over by their legal team just to make sure that all the terms and conditions are in favour of your festival. Um, and I think the sponsors are always very happy to sign a contract because the contract protects both sides of the partnership. And, and the same goes with artist contracts as well. Um, we, that, that's something that is really important. And there are standard kind of templates. AIF has produced standard terms and conditions for its members, for example. Now, not obviously they're quite generic, and then some some deals have particular things that need to be covered. I think another point on sponsorship is that um, there are sponsorship consultants, but in, in my experience it's generally not worth working with them because you're either paying them a retainer or they're taking a percentage of whatever they do and they either end up just um, kind of mopping up on conversations that you've already started and also I think who better to deliver your message to a sponsor than you, you, you know a consultant doesn't know your festival better than you do that's that's just my, my view on it, is that it's better to go direct, but more time consuming perhaps, um, and a learning curve. But um, that, that would be my view on that anyway. But it's worth doing because if you get a sponsor on board that comes back and works with you year on year, it's good for the money, but it's also good for the sponsor's promotional reach and helping you to spread the message about your festival. So it's definitely worth it working with sponsors, it just can take a while to build the relationship sometimes, but it's worth in the end. Hello, Rebecca and Paul, nice to meet you here. Uh, my question is about uh, team management. Uh, how you coordinate your team um, on the step uh, when the festival is uh, prepared? and uh, on the step uh, when it starts. For example, maybe you have some uh, tools, uh, some uh, secret approach, so some maybe your favorite uh, apps or something like this. Thank you. Um, sorry, that's a good question actually, because um, for us, we have um, quite a small core team of people. So we always make sure that each person in the team knows exactly who they are reporting to and exactly what their role is. Um, so we always build like a, a map that shows who does what so that we can see like there's the person that's overseeing everything, there's the production manager and there's the production assistant, they report to them. And it's really important that we take time to sit down with everyone whether there's somebody that's just involved for one or two days or someone that's involved for a lot longer than that and it can tell them exactly 
what we expect of them, and then also to raise concerns with us. And that takes a bit of time to do, but it's it's really worthwhile so that everyone knows exactly where they fit and who they can ask a question to, or who they should report to if they need to. Because things inevitably will happen that will go wrong, and it's just important that there's a clear line of communication. Um, there are. There are tools that you can use online to kind of be, do festival management. I know there's one called Mercato, which a lot of festivals use, and that's like a customer relationship and a kind of team management tool. We haven't used anything like that yet, but I always hear that people that do use them say they're good. So I think it's um, I think whether you use those kind of software or not, it's just important that you that you make sure that everyone in the team is briefed and also that you have a document that details exactly what everyone is doing in the festival. So that if, if someone, for example, was ill and they couldn't get out and have a bed at all and they had, were completely out of action, that someone else could pick up the shop and know exactly what they're doing um, during the festival itself. Yeah, I think just to back that up, roles and responsibilities are important, that that's clear and structured. Uh, personality as well, because you're going to be working with these people for long hours around the event. Um, you know, and under, under pressure, um, when it's small teams, I, I guess, you know, the ideal is that everyone stays within their remit, but you can often end up crossing over and people jumping in, supporting each other. Um, so I say that's important as well to to work with people that you, you know you feel comfortable with in that sort of environment um, that are quite calm under pressure. And um, I'd say a golden rule is, is you know don't work with anyone that you wouldn't go for a beer with. I guess <laughs> you've got to yeah you've got to have that connection and you know you're working towards this shared goal really. So. I think personality and, and structure are equally important.